All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Today, I have Esti Gabay. She is a luxury travel specialist and also an author. Thank you for being here, Esti. You're welcome. Nice to be here. Yes. So when did you fall in love with travel? Oh, early, very early. <laughs> um, I grew up in New York City. Uh, actually, I grew up on Long Island, which was very kind of small townish. And I always wanted to go to New York City and be part of the city and meet people from all over the world and, you know, just have that kind of be in that world mecca. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up going to high school in the city and college in the city as well, which was great. And when I was in college, um, you know, typical broke student, you know, want to be actress. I, I wanted to go on vacation. I hadn't really been to many places. I hadn't been anywhere really outside of my trips with my parents. And I wanted to go on a spring break trip. And I had that, I wrote it down as a goal. And then one day walking down the street, there was a flyer saying, host spring break trips and you can go for free. And that's when I started traveling. <laughs> It's my first group trip and I got to go for free to Cancun, bring along 10 friends and host. And yeah, that was the beginning of my travel career. Wow. So how did you get into being a travel specialist? Like how mm -hmm. did that whole thing evolve? Because yes, um, <laughs> it, was, it was, it was a long evolution because, um, so we originally, my, when my husband and I got married we well before we were even married we were engaged we were thinking we wanted to live in a warm beautiful city by the beach mm -hmm. and you know we were looking all over uh, the internet had like pretty much just become available <laughs> and we were thinking Sydney LA what 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 is this beautiful city by the beach and San Diego came up as having the nicest weather in the world the more 75 degree days than anywhere in the world so that's how we ended up here and San Diego is a vacation town. It's just, it's just one of the best places in the U.S. to go on vacation. And um, we had a, a beautiful home and a big backyard. And I built a retreat facility in my backyard, basically. I put palapas, you know, those Mexican palapas up. And I had space for, you know, 35 people in my backyard. And I started doing women's workshops and retreats out of my backyard. Shortly after that, I, I bought a vacation home, which I rented out. I managed it and rented it out for about five or six years. And then what happened is we decided to move into the vacation house. So I, I ended up renting my retreat space, my retreat house, and renting the vacation house, which I had, you know, go, go to retreats, like yoga retreats would come here and things. I ended up, you know, losing them both as a form of, you know, as a space. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, I still love doing retreats. Why don't I just learn how to do them in other places? And that's when I started researching travel. And specifically at that point, I was thinking I would be just a retreat planner and plan retreats. But then I thought about the list that I had because I was trying to be smart about it. And I realized I had this very valuable list from my vacation rental of luxury travelers that traveled in groups of 14. And I thought, well, what can I do with that? Maybe they, maybe they want to plan some other leisure trips. So that's when I said, okay, I should look into leisure travel as well. And that side of the business just really took off. Wow. So you really were into like travel and <laughs> you know, relaxation, like that is just something you're very passionate about mm -hmm. and you've always mm -hmm. worked on ways to make money like that, you know? Yep. So even with the retreats now, like, so you said a yoga retreat. So when you started mm -hmm. doing the retreats in your backyard, it was, so would you rent your space to anyone that was doing some type of relaxation retreat or something? I would rent the vacation rental Mm -hmm. for people doing the retreats because they could sleep 14 people in the house and it was by the beach in Encinitas which is like a yoga capital of the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, my house I did daytime events and I facilitated them I hosted them um, because in San Diego I just knew a lot of people that were in the self-development industry kind of like how you know people and you want them on your podcast yeah. I wanted them to talk to my 
my audience. I wanted them in my home. I wanted a free workshop <laughs> in my house. So uh, I invited people to come and it, the, the, the audience was like kind of half my audience, half their audience. And it worked out pretty well for everybody. Wow, that is yeah. so cool. I love that. So yeah, I think I went to San Diego for a wedding um, uh, the year before. Was it last year? No, it was last year. Girl, I can't remember. COVID has screwed up. Last year doesn't count. <laughs> right. I can't remember, but I went there and it was really nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I totally get what you're saying about it being like, you know, vacation town and really a nice place to visit. Yeah. So as a travel specialist, how mm -hmm. does a travel specialist make money? Okay. So uh, we used to be called travel agents. Mm -hmm kind of before the internet. And that's because travel agents used to make money by just kind of like booking your airfare and booking, you know, off of like a catalog or something, right? And then as the internet grew, people for a while didn't use agents as much. They were booking things on their own on online search engines and things. And then what happened eventually is that became really hard to do for people to do on their own. So the average person was taking, I think it was said, 30 hours of internet research before they book their trip, right? So <laughs> they, so that's why advisors, we changed, literally changed our name from travel agents to travel advisors or specialists or consultants. And that's how, uh, you know, we make money now giving advice because that's more important, you know, than just booking it you, you can't trust a, a, a review from someone you don't know. You don't know if they've ever stayed at a really nice hotel before. So maybe they're, this three-star hotel looks like a five-star to them. You know, you need a professional to give you advice. So, so, there's, so part of my business is that, is the consulting side of it. And there's a small fee to, for me to help people uh, build their travel bucket list and plan their trips. And then the other way a travel advisor makes money is through a commission, which is actually a very small amount from the vendors. So um, Air doesn't typically give commission anymore, but like from like you'd get like 10% of a hotel, for instance, as commission. And then you'd have to split that probably like 50-50 with a host agency, which is a bigger agency that has all the contracts with everybody in the industry, the cruise ships and everybody. So that's how you do it. So it's, it's your own business. It takes a while to get going like any business does. And uh, yeah, but you have to build it. Yeah. I love that you said it takes a while to build because people just, I don't know, everything is so microwavable these days. And they think that, especially with um, social media that pushes all these ads on people about making this amount of money in like six months, 12 months. Oh, I did it in 18 months. You know, like I just, I'm so sick of it. And I say this on every podcast. I know <laughs> my audience is sick of me, but I just want them to know that, you know, it's not true. It's not always the case. Like, yes, yeah, some people get into things and automatically take off. But for most of us, it's not that way. Right. Yeah. And I also, you know, I had 20 years of experience doing the retreats. I just didn't have the experience booking them, you know, like book, booking the hotel. So that was pretty easy. So, and my, so my contacts were there, my uh, sales skills were there, my facilitation skills, all, everything I needed was there. But I had read early on that it takes about three years to build a travel business. And it was exactly three years until my business was kind of exploded like when I was great and doing you know like a full-time income from the business wow yeah so what are sure. some of the struggles that you faced as an entrepreneur in the travel industry especially now let's start with talking about this you know COVID unfortunately mm -hmm. yeah you know um it that's kind of like my oh hell no moment that you like to talk about uh yeah. When, when COVID happened, I was literally, I was at Disney World when they shut it down, <laughs> okay? Shut it down. Everybody was there for spring break and summer, you know, spring vacations and we all got sent home. Um, and not, and you know, we didn't know, we didn't even know if we can get a flight back from Florida. And then of course, as soon as I got home, all the travel bans started. And so 
all those spring customers that I had, and actually up till October, I had to cancel all their trips yeah. and try to get them a refund. And sometimes I could not get them a refund. Sometimes I had to give them a credit, like Italy, literally the whole country said they're not giving refunds, they're just offering credits. So I had angry customers. And here I'm at the peak of my business and I had to spend another three months in that like total stress meltdown stage. And I, I called it, I called it negative income because I was working and giving my money back. Like I wasn't even, you know, I wasn't making any, I was literally returning the money because you don't get paid and travel until they take the trip. So yes, yeah, so that was my oh hell moment. And what I did about it was I said, okay, well, luckily I have other sources of income. That's good. And that was kind of, I, I had that set up because I knew the travel business was taking a while to build, right? I didn't rely on it. Um, and then I took that time First of all, I signed up for way too many online uh, programs. I think I signed up for like six online programs, how to build a blog, how to write a book, how to, you know, like everything you could possibly imagine I signed up for. And then um, I started the how to write a book program. And actually that's not true. I started with how to build your website and I was building a free offer for my website, right? Which was a downloadable, you know, worksheet about how to, how to plan your travel bucket list. And that worksheet came from my travel talk. And I realized there was just a lot more material in there. And so I was also doing the course on how to write a book. So I started writing a book based on my, tra my, my travel talk and my worksheet. That little worksheet became an entire book. And luckily I had you know, a good six months of it sitting on my laptop. So at first it was small and then I'd come in, I'd add a chapter or I'd, I'd find a book at the bookstore and travel and I'd be like, oh, my book needs to have something like that in it too. And I'd add to it. Um, so that's how I kind of pivoted my business during a time when it was really, I mean, it was, it was less than slow. It was just, it was banned. It was shut down. Yeah, absolutely. I was also one of those people that was calling my travel agent to get a refund because I had planned a trip to Spain for my husband mm. for his birthday and it was terrible, but I just stayed patient and I just cuz I I could only imagine what these travel, you know, agents were going through mm -hmm. with so many people probably calling them and they're stressed out because they're trying to get people's money back and mm -hmm. It was taking forever. Like I literally just got back all of my money. Um, I want to say at the end of December, and mm -hmm. this was from like March. We were supposed to go yeah. in March. Yeah. So um, yeah. yeah, I totally understand where you were, and <laughs> as a you know a consumer, like I was in that same struggle too. <laughs> yeah. Terrible. But luckily, you know, during the summer, a lot of people felt more confident traveling somewhat locally. They were wearing their masks. They were, you know, doing, you know, the airlines were doing a really great job of keeping, you know, social distancing and, and sanitizing the, 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 you know, the cabin. And so I did have a lot of people traveling over the summer in October and November uh, in places like the Caribbean and Mexico, because it's a short flight. You know, they could wear a mask for three hours and it's not a big deal. We could get in. They weren't, they weren't worried about getting in and getting out. And so I did have a, actually, because I stuck around and because I now had this book to help promote my business, I had more customers. And um, so that's, that's really, I think the, the gist of it, if you just stick around, you know, and know to take your time and do something long-term. Like the book I realized was a long-term a, a, a long-term product that I could offer potential clients. So it didn't mean that they had to want to travel right now. The, a travel bucket list is really something you do before you plan a trip. It, yeah. Once you're planning, like when you're planning that Spain trip, you were busy, you were researching hotels in Spain and you were thinking about what to do in Spain and should you learn Spanish and all this kind of stuff. It's, you're too busy. You're not going to think about six trips at the same time. But haven't we all been sitting around the past nine months with Wanderlust, thinking about getting out, <laughs> going somewhere, anywhere, right? So, and we have family around that we didn't have, you know, like I have my, my um, college daughter home 
right now too. So it's a great time to sit around the dining room table and talk about your future dreams, whether it's what you wanna do in your life in the future or whether it's how you wanna travel in the future. So that became a really good way for me to continue my business. And now I'm reaping the rewards of it because we're still at that time period where people are now kind of getting excited about traveling again. They're talking about it. They're waiting to get the vaccine and they're starting to plan travel. And before they book too much, before they get too involved in their next trip, I want them to read my book. <laughs> I want them to plan their whole list of trips because what happens then? They read the book, they know and trust me. Hopefully they like me, they know how to reach me. And now they can be my client for life because I, as their agent will know, or their advisor will know all their dream trips that they have in mind. So if they plan on one day, you know, in the future, six years from now, maybe they could do like an African safari and they have that on their list. It doesn't mean they have to book it with me right now, but I know, I remember, I know it's on their list. So when I talk to a vendor or go to a, you know, listen to a webinar on African safari companies, I'm going to listen. And I'm going to ask questions specifically that have to do with that family. Like, hey, how, how is it for kids? And, you know, is it wheelchair accessible or whatever, you know, whatever it means for that client. So um, that was my little, that was my big, oh, hell no, no moment. And how I, I think I've turned it around and it's become a, oh, hell yes moment. Yeah, that's awesome. So are there any other struggles that um, you face like on a day to day, aside from this major, you know, life altering situation, like on a day to day, what keeps you up at night about your business? You know, um, I, I don't think it's so much about the business that keeps me up at night. It's more my health. You know, we've all kind of like had, you know, had some struggles with being home a lot and I'm an extrovert and uh, my gym closed and I gained a lot of weight and you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I used to have a real problem with um, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. Mm -hmm. And so I could see that I, like I, I could get it back at any time, you know, like sometimes I have a hard day and I'll like sleep for three hours. Wow. Yeah. So the good news is because I've built a business, I knew I could build this business on my schedule. So it's okay. It's okay if I sleep for three hours in the middle of the day. Like nobody is, no boss is behind me saying I have to work nine to five. And, you know, when travel was happening, Europe was on a totally different time zone and it worked out great. You know, so I'm, I'm thankful for that. I'm careful about my health and keeping, keeping a good balance, what is important when you have your own business. Cause you can get really like carried away and working 24 seven. Yeah, that's so true too. Um, but that's like your, oh, hell yes, honey. Like <laughs> being able to like work whenever, you know, you want and not having the boss on you. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. One day. Oh God. And traveling all over the world, sometimes for free or at least at a discount, you know, yeah. that, that was the payoff. You know, I was traveling one week out of every month and I will be again. So you know, I actually, I just came back from a trip. So oh, I, I have been traveling. <laughs> Yeah, I actually went to St. Lucia in November for my birthday. So we did a little COVID trip and it was yeah. really a good time. I, I had a great time. I loved St. Lucia. It was beautiful. It was my first time there. So um, what is your favorite place to visit? Mm, well, uh, Bora Bora, for oh. sure. I mean, look at my, my book. The cover is Bora Bora. I'll show you a little bit closer. That's the Four Seasons Hotel. That was one of the overwater bungalows I stayed at. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been there, gosh, probably like six times. Um, all the different islands. I even went on a cruise, a Paul Gauguin cruise. That was very nice and a small ship. And we went into each port on each island and uh, the ship would stop in the middle of the marina and just turn to 360 degrees very slowly. So everyone got a view of the entire cove. Like, oh, it's just a beautiful place. So that kind of sets me up for my next question, which is what is the most luxurious thing that you have ever experienced on a vacation? That's a hard one. Um, well, 
we stayed at um, in, in Thailand at the Four Seasons Tented Camp. Okay. And even though it was Thailand and it was a tented camp, it was a Four Seasons and they did a nice job, right? And it was like Robinson Crusoe, um, you know, full, but like luxury Robinson Crusoe type, type of a tent um, overlooking what looked like an African safari in a river. And they had an elephant sanctuary there. And we took care of the elephants while we were there. Um, that's not luxurious sounding, I know, but it was pretty cool. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That was a nice place to stay. Really nice place to stay. Nice. Yeah. So what tips can you give us about planning an exotic vacation on a budget? Can you plan an exotic vacation on a budget? Yeah. So I like to tell people, you know, I know I, 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 the name luxury is in my title of my company, Luxurious Travel. Um, but if, if you look on my website, there's, there's some blogs about traveling. And I think that what's really important is that you what's more important to your vacation really where you sleep or what you're doing what activities that you're doing so if you're smart about how you spend your your budget right then you can spend more of your time doing the the experiences which make for more memorable trips that's what i say in the book as well so for instance i talked about uh, you know feeding uh, feeding the elephants and washing the elephants and things like that that is an experience i will never forget and if even if i didn't stay at the four seasons you know what was good about the four seasons was i knew that they were taking good care of those animals you know so <laughs> i didn't worry that i was not too concerned uh, those are happy elephants um, but in, in the same sense, if you stay somewhere that, you know, and you ask the right questions and it's, it's, it's a qualified place to stay. And what I mean by that is it's been vetted by someone professionally. It's, um, it's in a, a travel consortium. It has some type of, you know, like a, the, the host agency works with them directly. Not just anybody you find like on an Airbnb, for instance, because you can't trust pictures. You, you just can't, there's so much we can do with them now to make them look good. So I say, first plan the experience you wanna have and then find out what's the best place to do those experiences. And that may not be the first place you think of. Like you may think of the most expensive place cause they've advertised that's the best place to go scuba diving or whatever. But in reality, you could, you could probably do the best scuba diving in your life somewhere else and save a lot of money. Okay, good. So I want you to share four L O oh, hell no travel tips. Like these are things you should not do while when planning a luxurious vacation. Like if you can think of four, if you only- Yes, okay. All right, well, first of all, uh, uh, please do tell you know your, your listeners, go to my website because there is blog posts and infographics on these exact things on my website. There's a lot of free stuff you can download, free worksheets, but I say, oh hell no, do not plan a trip just quick and fast if you can. Plan that bucket list, like I said, plan that bucket list while you can. Map it out so that you know which trips should come first. Uh, so for instance, if you're young and fit, maybe now's the time to climb, my, uh, climb Mount Everest. You know, don't save that because you don't know what's going to happen, right? You don't know if COVID's going to hit you or whatever. So take the adventurous, you know, athletic trips when you can and maybe save the slow cruises and the bird watching and those kind of activities for later. So that's number one. Don't, don't not, well, well, I guess it's a whole, oh, hell yes, plan that bucket list. The other really important thing is don't underestimate that travel is gonna come back in a really big way. And when it does, you're gonna have a hard time booking something. Because as you know, all those people that got credit, as soon as the travel bans are over, they're gonna be wanting to travel. And um, they've, you know, they've already spent the money. So they're gonna be the first ones to get reservations. And especially like for cruises, because cruisers have very um, loyal customers that cruise every year. And they've missed like two cruises probably at this point, and they're just like raring to go. So you may not be able to find the best deal or book something last minute. 
because like I said, it's going to open up pretty fast. Even now, like I said, if you want to go to Cancun or the Caribbean, you may not have the availability that you think you should have at this point. Um, another really big oh hell no thing is booking a trip without getting travel insurance. I, I can't say enough about it. And even before COVID, I would have told everybody, please, please get travel insurance because Murphy's Law, something is going to happen if you don't get travel insurance, right? There, but you never know. There's hurricanes that happen. There's you get ill, you break a leg. Um, you know, COVID, people who had canceled for any reason insurance got their money back. So when so a lot of people didn't. Let me just tell you, Esty, I'm on the fence about that. <laughs> I always get travel insurance, right? Because you, what you're saying is true. And with this COVID thing, I had my insurance and then I put my claim in and my trip literally got canceled. Like I was one of those people like, oh, everything's going to be fine. I'm just packing my stuff. My friend's like, are you going to wear a mask? I'm like, oh, I don't think so. I think we're going to be fine. <laughs> right. Yeah. And um, I, my trip was canceled by the airline, canceled the hotels, everything. Mm -hmm. And I put my insurance claim in and they were like, oh, no, this isn't really like something that we would cover. Like th this isn't. Well, you, you have to read, you have to read the insurance claim and there's lots of different types of travel insurance. You know, there's the cheapy travel insurance that doesn't cover much. And then there's the cancel for any reason. You could cancel if you don't like your hair that day, you know, well, <laughs> that's that's, that, that makes a difference when you uh -huh. say that because when you go to book your flight or whatever, your trip, it, it just says travel protection. Do you want travel yeah. protection? Yes, I do. So that makes a difference. Now I fought and I did get my money back. So yes, mm -hmm. I, I did end up coming out victorious. <laughs> but um, I like that you made that point because a lot mm -hmm. of people may not know that because uh, I, yeah. When I even I was one of those people. I was one of those people that said, I don't need insurance. My American Express card will cover most of it or, you know, whatever. I'll be fine. There's a lot of things that your regular insurance or your American Express card are not going to cover. Okay. Um, and, and the industry has changed because of COVID too. That's another thing. So you need to do the other, oh, hell no, is don't plan something without doing some research. Yeah, we're having a travel advisor who can do the research for you, because I like for insurance, I know which plans are covering travel, you know, cancellation for any reasons, mm -hmm. and which ones aren't. I know which hotels are offering, you know, full refunds and which ones are not and what the cancellation policies are. You know, right. all those things are really important. Yeah, you want to make sure you have a good travel agent. I thought I had a good travel agent and she just bailed on me. I don't know what happened. She, I don't know if she got let go or she quit, but yeah. she never even gave me the heads up like, hey girl, guess what? I'm not going to be there, but call Pat. She'll take care of you. Nothing. <laughs> no, it's not. You know, I literally went into the hospital in April. I had a, a, like a, a mini stroke. It was during that time that I was telling you where people were calling me and saying like they were going to sue because they couldn't get their money back from Italy. Yeah. I literally had a mini stroke and was in the hospital. She could have been too. We were all having, a, we had, a, we were having a hard time. You know what I, I mean? No, but I mean, like before you left, like, I don't know if she, if she was sick or something, but she, she could have dropped me an email even after she got better. <laughs> I know. I've been using her for years. I know. You don't know. I mean, COVID, you know, 2 million people have died of COVID in the U.S. I hate to think that that happened to her, but you never know. I would, I would think that someone at work would say, oh my God, I'm sorry. You know, yeah. she, this happened. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I hope she's okay. I, get, I yeah. hope she is, but yeah. <laughs> it's tough, you know. We, so they say about 50% of the travel advisors will hope to still be in business within the next six months, but it wow. depends on the, on the industry picking back up. And that's, I think those numbers are, are low because they haven't had an income for nine months or 10 months. And most of those travel advisors are not working in a, in a full-time job. You know, the, the ones that, the ones that I'm talking about, the independent contractors are building their own business. Yeah. And so that's tough. You know, they, they, they might've quit by now, but you know, I, my, I, like we said, my opinion was, you know, don't quit, just be prepared, be prepared for the ups and downs. Cause that happens, you know, there's, 
it happens in lots of industries. Yeah, that's really a good point. You know, if you're going to be in this industry, you have to make sure that you have a backup plan. Yeah, there was, you know, 9-11, there was SARS. There were other times, you know, in the past, you know, 10 years or 20 years where things happened that shut down the industry as well. Yeah. So, or you could get sick, you know, like we've said, you could, something can happen to you and you can't, you can't put in the time for three months or something. So it, 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 it pays to be prepared for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So you, you wrote a book and it's entitled your travel bucket list, right? Why do you think it's a good idea for people to make a travel bucket list? Well, that's my favorite question. (laughs) Um, There, so the subtitle of the book, it's long, but it's important. It's how to enrich your life with great adventures and unforgettable memories. And that's why it's important to do a travel bucket list to accomplish that. And the way that you do that is by taking time to really reflect on why travel is important to you and what type of travel do you want to do? And I I talk about it in the book. There's so many different types of travel that people don't think of. I mean, going on a tropical vacation and sitting by the pool is the simplest of all travel vacations. There's so many adventures to be had. There's so many different things. There's culinary tours and there's cycling trips and there's uh, language immersion and and volunteer uh, tourism. There's so many different things that you could do to enrich your life and have those great adventures. And the other thing is if you plan a travel bucket list, like I said, you can plan ahead for important times in your life, milestones that cement in that trip and that time in your life. So that's why like a honeymoon, you always remember your honeymoon because it's a milestone, right? Um, I tell a lot of my younger clients to plan a baby moon just before they have the, the first baby, you know, and they're maybe five months pregnant and they're feeling pretty good. Great time to go on vacation because you're going to remember that was the vacation you took just before you had the baby and look at the pictures. You got a little tummy and all that. It's cute. Um, A birthday, a big birthday, like a 50th birthday is a fantastic time to, you know, for like women to grab their girlfriends and go to a spa and do something luxurious that has to do with self-care and is, you know, just for them. So uh, that kind of stuff takes pre-planning and it takes dreaming a little bit. I mean, you got to like, you got to kind of dig deep and think, you know, what are those trips? What, what, what do I want to mix in there after, you know, before and after the, the vacation that's just sitting by the beach? Do I want to mix in something a little bit more exciting, a little bit further out, a little bit more adventurous? Uh, those are the ones that you want to throw into a travel bucket list. Okay. So how many places are left on your travel bucket list? <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's a funny question that I get asked a lot and I never have a straight answer for, because first of all, I just told you my bucket list isn't really built on places. Mm -hmm. It's built on experiences, right? When, when you have the experiences that you know, you want to do first, then the places come up for you and they're, and they might change, you know? So, um, yeah, so I, I really wanted to learn about Greece. I've, I was always interested in Greece, um, in, in philosophy and in the architecture for, for all those reasons, not the beaches so much, because I don't think the beaches look that great to tell you the truth compared to the Caribbean, <laughs> but just the culture of Greece and the Mediterranean lifestyle has really interested me. So that was the trip that I got canceled on mm-hmm. in, uh, in the spring. Yeah. was that trip. And I was actually going to get on a yacht uh, for free for four days because they wanted me to test it out and recommend it to my clients and take a trip um, around Greece and Croatia. Mm-hmm. And I was excited to see those places. So that's next on my bucket list. Well, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, this question you answered when you said you went to Bora Bora six times. (laughs) You never get bored of Bora Bora. It's not boring. There's so many things to do there, uh, especially if you like to snorkel or scuba dive. Uh, You can see a a new marine animal every day. Wow, I'm sure. It's just stunning. So what skill set would you say that one needs to have to be a successful travel specialist? Well, um, 
you need all the same skill sets anybody needs to run a business. So, you know, you le need to learn people skills and customer service first and foremost. If you do not have a high emotional IQ, you probably won't do well in this industry because you need to know how to, how to talk to people and how to get to know people. Because the better you can get to know people, the better you can plan the ideal trip for them. The rest you can learn. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really important. Emotional intelligence all, of, all the way around, especially in that business. Because when you got to tell someone that the hotel is not giving them their damn money back, <laughs> <laughs> you better be skilled. <laughs> but also, you know, because I, I plan people's bucket lists, um, I also have a program that I do. It's a VIP program that's a software called Wanderlist through Virtuoso. And it's like the, the high level computer program to plan your bucket list. And what I do there is I have the whole family go online and they all separately, like even the little kids go online and, and choose things like a Netflix style a program where they can choose like what kind of adventures they want to have and what places they want to go to and all that kind of stuff right and then I come and I meet the whole family together and I have to kind of negotiate with all the family members to find a trip that matches everybody's needs and and you know the software will do it the software will like name you know the top 30 in order of preference but a lot of the times I have to maybe convince the parents a little bit or, or a spouse that's not so into it, why it's important to the other people to do that type of trip. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I mean, almost anybody, if they're gonna have an adventure, has to go out of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So um, do you feel like you are doing purpose work? And if mm -hmm. you do, what specifically would you define as you know, the purpose-driven part of the work that you're doing? You know, that's really interesting because it really came around for me when I published the book, because before then I, I had something that I was passionate about. I was passionate about travel, but I didn't really feel like there was a really like a sense of purpose, you know, like a big sense of, you know, unearthly, you know, purpose to it. But then as I was writing the book, and especially as I kept adding to the book, the old part of me, the self-development facilitator person yeah. started coming up again. And I started talking in the book about having the right mindset to travel big and anticipate travel. And I started talking about setting goals and how to set goals to make things happen. And all those passionate subjects that I had studied for 20 years have now become part of my niche, you know, because that's, that's how I talk to my clients and that's how I wrote the book. So I'm kind of glad that no, you know, I did it even just for that reason, because it found me a way to be, to talk more about what I'm passionate about, which is, is enriching your life and having a better life. Yeah, that's great. I love that. So I know you shared an oh hell no moment earlier about, you know, COVID and all that stuff, but I'm sure you have another oh hell no moment that you can share with us that changed your mind about something or changed your perspective on something, or just, I don't know, maybe just blew your mind maybe it was a mm -hmm. vacation or mm -hmm. something that happened that you're like oh hell no it could be yeah. good it could be bad but it's just yeah like i got a great i got a great story for you it's in the book too and it's so true and i tell this story a lot when i talk about how you can enrich your kids development your children through travel how you help them develop into brave world citizens right and i tell the story of how my daughter when she was 12 was really into sharks and saving sharks from extinction. It was kind of a weird thing for her to be into, I thought, but she was really into it. And I was like, oh, hell no, we're not gonna like start putting posters around and do Instagram posts about saving sharks, right? And she said, mom, I wanna go swim with sharks. That's a hell no, right? <laughs> I was like, oh no. <laughs> right? But I thought about it and I said, you know what? Let's plan a vacation let's see what's out there. And she, and I said, why don't you do some research and see? And, you know, there are actually leopard sharks that are completely docile and other types of sharks that are not dangerous at all that you could swim with. Mm -hmm. That's not what we did. <laughs> we, we, so we got scuba certified and then we went to Fiji, which is a place I didn't even have on my radar to go to, 
but had this special place called the bistro where they fed the sharks tuna and the sharks just kind of knew the drill. And there were these big bull sharks and they'd swim in like circles and you just kind of like hide behind a, you know, a little bit of, of you know, coral. <laughs> And you didn't feed them, the, the dive masters would feed the sharks, but they were all right there. And again, you, I was thinking like, oh, hell no, but we did it, we did it. It took us months to get scuba certified. It took us a year before we did that trip, but it kept my daughter interested in scuba and in, in, in sharks. And we had a fantastic adventure on this trip. And I know now, if you ask my daughter, she's 18 now, is she afraid of anything? She's not afraid of anything. Nothing. What, what could she be afraid of? She swam with sharks. She's got nothing to worry about. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> I don't know if I could have done that. Well, I can't swim. <laughs> so. But that, that's on my list, SD. That's on my mm -hmm. list. You know, I did my due diligence. No one had died yet and seemed, you know, relatively safe. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's scary, but that's good. She's brave. I don't know. These mm -hmm. kids today, they're very brave. My daughter's mm -hmm. like that too, you know? Mm -hmm. So, all right. So it was amazing having you on the show. Please tell everyone where they can buy your book, check out your blogs, connect with you, all those good things. Yeah, actually you could even see a little video of that shark dive. Uh, on my website. We have like a one minute shark dive compilation that we did, which is really fun. Looks like a horror movie, um, but no one gets hurt. <laughs> uh, if you go to my website, it's luxuristravel.com. So that's like stylist kind of, it's L-U-X-U-R-I-S-T. And I'm sure you'll have it, you know, on your website so they can look it up there. If you go to luxurious travel, and you look up there, you can go look just travel slash book. You can find out all about my book. You can go to free gifts and you can download a free travel a trip planner and a free compilation of worksheets from the book that help you plan your travel bucket list. And then on the blog, of course, there's lots of tips and trips that you could see short videos of to kind of see what the experience is really like. Nice, thank you so much. You're welcome. It was fun talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>